Now let's talk about where, when things go wrong in the CNS. So when we can't maintain homeostasis, so when things get off balance, depending on exactly what is happening and where it is occurring, it's called different things. So paralysis is where there's a loss of motor functioning. So that's probably where there's gonna be an issue um, in the anterior uh, horn. Now, obviously that can also happen up in the brain, but since we're talking about spinal cord, um, we'll talk about it here. So paresthesia, that's a loss of sensory function. So that's probably gonna be an issue in the posterior horn damage. If you have paraplegia, that's paralysis of both lower limbs. So that's gonna be anterior horns um, and, and probably posterior horns too. So, uh, so both lower limbs. Hemiplegia, that would be one side of the body. So that would be where like the left side of the spinal cord is affected, um, which controls the right side of the body. So um, then now quadriplegia, that's where all four limbs, so basically paralyzed from the neck down. So let me write this here, uh, paraplegia. So this would be like waist down, paralyzed, quadriplegia, neck down. Now there's a condition called cerebral palsy or cerebral palsy. This is where there's a loss of muscle control, so they can't they can't uh, move appropriately. Um, traditionally, this was come from brain damage. They thought it was due to um, oxygen at birth. There are other causes um, now that we know of. There can be a condition during development and uh, of in utero called anencephaly, and this is where um, the neural folds, they fail to actually fuse together, so there's not an intact nervous system. Uh, the body will develop, but the brain does not, so the, the, the baby may, may be born, but it is, it is not, but the baby will not survive uh, very long. Um, most often they're stillborn, um, or they do not survive to birth. Um, so it's a very sad situation. Fortunately, it doesn't happen often, but um, you do want to respect um, the parents and their choices uh, there. It's, it's a difficult situation. Spina bifida, this is where um, the spinal cord is exposed. Generally, it's going to be in the lumbosacral area where the vertebrae just don't fuse. So there, there's going to be some exposed spinal cord. Um, this happens very early in development, um, in utero, and uh, one of the things that prevents that is folic acid. So these these two things these are uh, together called neural tube defects, and folic acid helps prevent that. Um, so that's one of the thing, key things that's in prenatal vitamins is a higher level of folic acid. Um, but now we fortify um, a lot of bread and grains with folic acid um, as well. So this does not happen near as much in the Western world, but um, it does still occur. Um, and it, it is a difficult um, situation and disability. So let's go and let's talk about spinal nerves. Um, what is a nerve? A nerve, these are parallel fibers, parallel axons that are covered with connective tissue. So they're going to have wrappings that are going to be similar to how the muscles are going to be wrapped. The first one is called, this is the inner one. So this is the endoneurium. So you may have heard the endomycium. And so that surrounds each particular axon. Then you have the perineurium and that surrounds each group. So there's like the perimycium in a muscle. And then you have the epineurium 
and that surrounds the entire nerve. Now, nerves can be classified according to the direction of, this is AP is the action potential. So which way is the information potent? potential. So afferent or afferent, but I say afferent because otherwise I get confused. So that is sensory and kind of the mnemonic device for that is, so this is carrying information to the CNS. So you can say SAT stands for sensory afferent towards, so we'll S-A-T, towards the CNS, so up to the brain. Efferent is motor, and that carries information away from the CNS. And then you have mixed nerves, which have axons of both sensory and motor. Now we call um, these nerves based on where they come from. Cranial nerves originate in the brain. Spinal nerves originate in the spinal cord. So there's 12 cranial nerves. You'll have to learn them in AMP2. There's 31 spinal nerves. Uh, let me go ahead and get my pictures on out here. All right. So I told you in the spinal nerves, there are 31 pairs, one for each vertebrae. They're all mixed because that's what happens um, when you have the uh, fusion of uh, the posterior root and the anterior root. So you have going towards and you have going away. Now, oh here I already said that, posterior root and anterior root. Posterior root, that's going to be your sensory. Anterior root, that's going to be the motor. Now, dermatomes. A dermatome is a specific area or region of skin and underlying tissue that is supplied by a single spinal nerve. And there's 30 of them, so not C1, but there's 30 others. Now, anesthesia. Anesthesia is a loss of sensation or numbness along the specific region because of that dermatome's spinal nerve. So if you deal with this nerve, so sometimes they um, take advantage of this in anesthesia and they'll put in nerve blocks where they'll deliberately do this to help reduce pain. I'll show you a picture of it too. Um, now, you can also have referred visceral pain. And this is where pain that's in a visceral organ, so like um, the stomach, the gallbladder, the liver, you might think it's actually pain in the dermatome, like skin pain of the shared spinal nerve. So sometimes they'll have... Um, you know, you, you would have maybe like right upper quadrant pain, like liver pain, but you would feel it in your back uh, because of where the, the spinal, turn, spinal nerve is. So here's an example here. The appendix comes from the T10 region, which carries sensory information about the umbilical region. So, appendix pain, you actually feel it around the belly button. There's a test they can do where they like make you lift your neck and move your knee and 
that's a test for it. Um, heart attack, so pain in the heart often reveals itself as pain down the left arm. And then let's talk about shingles. You can only have shingles if you've had chicken pox. You cannot get shingles if you've never had chicken pox. So if you've gotten a vaccine, you won't get shingles. So, but if you get chicken pox, the actual disease, not the uh, vaccine, it resolves and it goes and hides out in the posterior ganglia. And sometime later in life, usually due to like a stressful situation, um, high dose of steroids, uh, some, some sort of stress, it's gonna get activated later in life, uh, generally sometime when the immune system is down and it's gonna go through the sensory neuron into its dermatome. So shingles has a weird pattern. So I'm gonna show you a picture here. The dermatome map, this is on page 556. So there's no um, C1 dermatome, but here's C2, top of the head, back of the head, different parts of the neck. So here's the neck and part of the arm. So it just kind of, kind of depends here. So this is where the appendix is. So it might be felt here, it might be felt here, it might be felt in the back, on down, lumbar, sacral, sacral is a lot of the back of the leg. Um, so someone that has, down here, this is somebody that has shingles. So it's on this particular rash. So here it looks like they're affected and somewhere around like their T6 or T7 uh, dermatome there. There is a vaccine for people that have had chicken pox to help boost their immunity to keep them from getting shingles. Um, it was a big deal when it came out. Now there were a lot of side effects associated with it, so it's kind of strange. But let's go ahead and move on. Let's talk about specific body regions and how they're innervated. So spinal nerves, they actually exit out from the spinal column, meaning where the vertebrae are stacked. As we already said, the intervertebral foramen. And then the mixed nerves branch out into a posterior ramus and an anterior ramus. So going into the mixed nerve, so from, um, so here's the spinal cord um, to the spinal nerve. So here you have your um, posterior root and your anterior root, then the spinal nerve, then you're gonna have your posterior ramus and your anterior ramus. So ramus is in the body, root is between the nerve and the spinal cord. So they sound similar, just make sure you know which is which and where they're located. So the posterior ramus, that's gonna be smaller. It's in the back. It's gonna innervate the muscles and the skin in the back, because it's smaller. The anterior ramus is gonna be larger. It's gonna do muscle, skin, as well as organs that are in front of the spinal column. So here, let me kind of show you this picture here. So here is the spinal cord. There's your gray matter, posterior, anterior. So coming out of the spinal cord, your posterior root, your anterior root, coming into the spinal nerve. So where they come together, there's the spinal nerve. And then it immediately splits. And where it splits out, you have the small portion that goes in the back. That's the posterior ramus. And then you have this larger part that comes to the front and that's the anterior ramus. Now, when you are in the T-spine, so T2 to T12, these are all called intercostal nerves. So intercostal 
think rib cage. So all along the rib cage. Now, that would be these here. So these are your intercostal nerves. So they're gonna go right along the ribs and there. Everywhere else, when you're not in T2 to T12, they're gonna form what are called a plexus or plural plexuses. And these are where the nerves and their axons are all just gonna kind of come together in this like weird looking web. So just kind of try to make your fingers go as crazy as possible. Now, so each plexus has the branch there contains fibers from several spinal nerves. Now, why is this a good thing? That's a good thing because you can have damage to one particular spinal segment. That means you do not have, um, so it does not completely paralyze um, the limb. So um, it's, some redundancy there. This is also good um, in when you're in the actual limb area. So um, for like a gunshot wound or stabbing, if it if it gets um, if it cuts a few of these, the person doesn't lose full control of their arm or leg. They can still move it. It might be a little bit numb, or they may not move it as well, but they still have retain some control. Now let's talk about these plexuses. You'll cover these again in AMP2 when you talk about um, muscles. But so the first one is the cervical plexus. So that's going to be the C spine, the cervical region, the neck region. This comes from the anterior rami or the ramus of C1 to C4, so the very top portion 